Good morning, church. Let's join together here and sing. church that nothing shall be impossible through him. But nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus our God unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus.
this night You were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the good ways of God All my life you have been Good to see you guys this morning. If you have your Bible, I'll open up the Old Testament book of Exodus. Old Testament book of Exodus chapter 14. If you're a guest with us, I want to welcome you. If you're watching online or in person, if you're here with us today, I um, would love to know who you are. At the end of the service, our ushers will be at the back. You can uh, put your name on a, on a sheet of paper and a phone number. would love to be able to connect with you. If you're online, uh, if you'd uh, share the post on Facebook, that helps us uh, kind of share the good news, not just with our friends, but with your friends as well. So I hope you'll, hope you'll do that. If you want to give, we have a, a new way of giving that we are kind of piloting, working out. It's text to give. I'll show you this, and I'll put it up at the end of the service. You can come back up and uh, check that out as well, uh, especially if you're watching online. Uh, just click that uh, text, give to connect to that number, and uh, follow the instructions. It's super easy. And I uh, hope you'll do that. Exodus chapter 14. If you've been with us over the last few weeks, this is week five in the installment on the Moses series. We've been following the life of Moses, really one of the great characters of the Old Testament. And we come to Moses at really uh, a unique time. It's the, it's the penultimate time in the life of the Israelites. They've, they've come from their bondage. Uh, they are free at this point. If you were with us last week, we kind of talked about the Passover coming out of the Passover, that 10th and final plague. 
The Israelites are free at this point, but they're on the run, running for their life, and Pharaoh and the Egyptians are pursuing them. Uh, I don't know that there are probably many of us in this room that can really relate to being on the run for your life. You know, you see it in old Western movies and things like that, you know, people that are on the run and worried and being pursued. You know, none of us have probably ever really been pursued, at least I hope not, in, uh, in that way. But if you can just put yourself in the psychology of the Israelites, they've, they've spent their life in bondage, and now they, they are on the run, literally, literally, for their, for their life. And it puts them in a very, very interesting situation. We're going to be talking about uh, the Red Sea and the parting of the Red Sea this morning. Um, even if you've not read it in the Bible, you've probably seen the movie and know that this is kind of the, the apex, if you will, of the, the ministry of Moses and the Israelites. The Red Sea literally parts. Israelites walk through, spoiler alert, and then the Egyptians come behind them and they're, they're caught up and the, and the sea closes in on them. Really, really an amazing story, but if you could hit rewind before that ever happens, the Israelites are here camped on the doorstep. I want you to think of what's happened. That they've been on the run, they're fleeing, and then they, they come up to the Red Sea. Now, this isn't the Red Creek, it's the Red Sea. This is a huge body of water. Now, if you're on the run and you're being pursued by the Egyptians and Pharaoh, and you come up to the Red Sea, that, that seems like, oh no, this is the end of the road. We're about, we're, about to, we're about to lose it. There's no way to go forward. There's no way to go backwards. We're, we're dead where we stand. You know, that, that really seems like uh, you'd want to turn to the boss, turn to Moses, say, thanks a lot for getting us out of Egypt. We're about to die right now. That's really the psychology of what's, what's going on. And I think for, for a lot of us, we can relate in the sense that, you know, we value strength in our society. We like people that are they're big and strong. We like people that stand on top of the podium and wear the gold medal. Uh, we always want to be in first place. The interesting thing is that as you read Scripture and kind of uh, draw out this theme throughout Scripture, God doesn't want us strong. Let me explain. God, God wants to be our strength. He doesn't want us strong in our own might. Perhaps a better way to say this is God wants us to be really strong, which is, which is different than the way that we typically view strength. We often want to be strong in a way that reflects well on us, right? I'm trying to go back to the gym. I go several days a week, and if you've ever been to the gym, there's a real interesting dynamic. Uh, usually around the tricep machine or things like that, there's, there are mirrors all over the place in the gym, first of all, and everybody comes up to the tricep machine, they're doing that, and they're looking in the mirror just to, you know, just to, just to see. You see that all the time. People are lifting and they're watching, and they're lifting and they're watching. They're, we want to be strong in a way that looks good on us. But the interesting thing is you look at Scripture, God wants us to be strong in a way that reflects well on Him. The way that we view strength and value strength in our, in our society is just totally mixed up from the, from the biblical standpoint. So uh, of all things, this is really a lesson on strength and how God best uses us. So we're going to follow the story of the Israelites. They've come up to the, de uh, to the Red Sea. In their mind, this is, this is a dead end. It's the end of the road. The Pharaoh... Egyptians are right behind us, and, and we're literally about to die, either by sword or by drowning. Here's what they learned. Let's dig in this morning. Uh, several lessons that I think uh, the Egyptians learned. The first one is this, uh, the Egyptians, the Israelites learned. The first one is this, is that God doesn't do dead ends, right? They think it's a dead end. They're about to die either by the, the sea drowning, they're either going to die by the sword, uh, but they think they're going to die. But God doesn't do dead ends. In Exodus 12, the people of Israel had been miraculously released from their slavery, led out of Egypt by Moses, but by the time we get to Exodus 14, they were encamped by the Red Sea in a vulnerable and probably puzzling position. Because you have to think, God, you've done all this, we've seen all the plagues, we've seen how you've moved in all these ways, and this, this is the way it's going to end? But the cool thing is that God had purposefully instructed Moses to lead Israel here because God had a plan. See, God doesn't do 
dead ends. God, God had a plan for all this. In fact, he had orchestrated the events. God's plan was to humiliate Pharaoh and the Egyptians one last dramatic time, a, dr- a dramatic exclamation point to place all of Israel that they would be able to look and see that he is the God, not just of Israel, but of the whole world. Let's dig in. Um, Exodus chapter 14. We're going to read verses 2 uh, through 4 together. Exodus chapter 14, verses 2 through 4. And it says, uh, Then the Lord said to Moses, verse 1, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of uh, Piharoeth, between Migdal and the camp of the sea, in front of baal Siphon, that you shall uh, encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. In other words, uh, God wanted them to camp this specific way so that when Pharaoh comes, he's going to see them there and say, ha, look at this, a bunch of losers, they're lost in the wilderness, and they're about to die. Verse 4, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, God says, and he will pursue them, and I will get the glory over Pharaoh and all his host." And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. See, so God's plan is different from the Israelites. You say, well, how how do you know? What were the Israelites thinking? Well, skip down to verse 11. We're not going to read all of it. Um, But if you look at verse 11, it says this. That they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? So they're there, they're camped. Moses knows what God has told him, but all the Israelites are looking and saying, Moses, what what have you done? Are there no graves in Egypt that you had to take us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Just think about that. In the the mind of a people that have been enslaved, they're thinking in their mind, we're really better off in Egypt. What have, you, what have you done, Moses? You've taken us to this dead end, and we're about to die. But they learned a very valuable lesson. God doesn't do dead ends. You see, they were trapped in a weak place. But here's a really interesting thing about this that you and I need to get our minds around. They were trapped in a weak place, a weak place that was orchestrated by God. See, in their minds, they were in the most vulnerable position. Here they are in front of the Red Sea, about to die in this very weak place that God had designed for them. Doesn't that just run contrary to our notion? Wait a minute. They're they're at their weakest. They're at their most vulnerable. Nobody likes to be there. I don't like to be there. Do you you ever been there at a time in your life you feel like, gosh, The whole world's about to cave in around me, and I just feel like I'm in a weak, vulnerable place. It's really cool how God can use and even design these places to bring glory to himself. See, we don't serve a God that does dead ends. That's the first thing. Let's move on. Number two, our personal comfort is not always God's ultimate goal. That's a really hard thing for us to get our minds around, but if God's going to put us in these places, I think for the Israelites, if they realized anything, they learned that their personal comfort probably wasn't God's ultimate goal. And the same is true for us. Our tendency is to make our personal comfort the most important thing in our life. Maybe it's a survival instinct. I don't know what that is about us, but it's, it's true for every one of us in this room. We value being comfortable. We just like it better. It's a thousand degrees outside. When you walk into a room and feel that AC, there's just a, you know, it just, it just feels good. We value that comfort. We'd rather be comfortable than outside in the hot. In our, our own spiritual life, the same thing is true. We, we want to be comfortable, but the truth is sometimes God needs to get us outside our comfort zone. We want God to order our circumstances in a way that makes sense to us, that's comfortable for us. But God, God just doesn't do that. His glory is not something that, that we value, but God can often be glorified by those challenging circumstances 
that we find ourselves in. Over and over in Scripture, just as we see here in Exodus 14, God's goal is to get the glory from the situations. You see, God is glorified when He displays His strength, His wisdom, His sufficiency over the circumstances in our life. Even though we know this principle, we often act just like the Israelites. What in the world's going on? Are there no graves back in Egypt that I have to come out here and die at this place? We say, why God? What, what good can come of this? I just don't see the point of having to go through this. What are you trying to do in my life? There have been so many times, if we're to be honest, that we find ourselves in that circumstances that we're just asking, why? God, what in the world is going on in my life? God has a very interesting response to this. I want you to notice that God doesn't answer their complaining question. Instead, he says something really interesting in verse verse 13. So God tells Moses, here's what I want you to say. Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. Now, for most of the Israelites, they thought, yeah, I'm never going to see him again because I'm about to die. They're going to they're kill me. God says, no. Moses speaks to him. He says, no, listen, here, here's what I want you to do. Fear not. Stand firm. Those are, those are two really simple commands on the surface but very difficult to walk out. Have you ever found yourself in a situation in your life where you're like, I, I just feel like I need, I need to do something. I got I to gotta do something about this. And, and the word that God speaks in your spirit is, listen, the same thing he said to Moses and the Israelites, fear not, stand firm. Fear not. Don't be afraid of what you see around you. Don't be afraid of what looks like a hopeless circumstance. And then stand firm. I don't know about you, but that that second command is probably more difficult than the first for me. I can rest knowing that God is in control, that he's strong enough uh, to be Lord over all the circumstances in my life, but that that stand firm is really hard because I I need to do something. I'm I'm better off doing something. I need to walk it out and build something, tear it down. Let, Let me do something tangible, God, but isn't it so interesting that often in our lives, the, the word that we receive is, listen, just fear not and stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work out for you today. And then this promise, Moses says, listen, you're not going to see the Egyptians after today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. And then verse 14 The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Fear not, stand firm, for you're going to see the salvation of the Lord, because God is about to fight for you, and all you have to do is be silent. It's another thing I struggle with. I don't know about you. I feel like I need to say something. I need to speak into this situation. But God's saying, no, listen, this, this is just the perfect picture of God saying, listen, you just stand firm. I've got this. i got this. All you have to do is stand still and be silent. Continue to make choices and live your life in a way that shows your faith and your confidence are in God. Not in your own ability, in your own strength, in your own smarts, in your own good looks or whatever that God said, no, no, no. It's not about any of that. Just stand firm. The Israelites could have bolted. They could have looked for an escape route. You know, the the Egyptians behind them, the Red Sea in front of them. It's like, man, I'm going left. Moses had to say that. He said, no, no, no. Fear not. Stand, Stand firm. Stay where you are. Because had they bolted, they would have missed one of the most dramatic movings of God in the entire Bible. I mean, really, the parting of the Red Sea has to be top 10, right, of all of God's miracles. Had the Israelites bolted, they would have missed this. See the salvation of the Lord. Believe that in and through all your circumstances, 
tough spots included, that God is working out this eternal salvation in you. God's got a plan. He's not going to leave you alone there. You're not going to drown in the Red Sea, and you're not going to be slain by the Egyptians that are behind you. But God has this plan. This salvation is one that is 100% by his strength and his might and 0% ours. That's really the good news, is that all we have to do is to fear not, stand firm, and the Lord will fight for you. Let's move on. That kind of goes into this, this third point that's really important. True victory is only found when we allow God to fight for us. That's a hard thing to do, just to stand still, be silent, and allow God to fight for us. But the truth is, that's when true victory is found. When the Egyptian army showed up, you know, God could have handled this a different way. There are different ways that God handles this throughout Scripture. Think about the story of Samson. It's one of my favorite Old Testament stories. You remember Samson, the mighty man of strength? Samson uh, slayed a thousand Philistines on his own with the, with the jawbone of a donkey. God could have pulled that here. You know, miraculously, all the Israelites could have just lifted up the jawbone of a donkey and they could have just gone to war. And they could have, in and on their own might, just slain every one of the Egyptians that were pursuing them. God didn't do that. Why didn't God do that? Because God had another plan. God had something else in store. True victory is found when we allow God to fight for us. Here's what I think. I think God wanted Israel to understand that he was their strength and their salvation and that he would become their song. And that's why they ended up in this weak, helpless place. Because God had a plan. And he was about to orchestrate something really, really cool right there in their midst. Last thing, number four, reminds us of this. The Exodus reminds us that God is our deliverer. That God is our deliverer. They end up singing this song. Chapter 15, verse 2, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Remember, remember what God said, fear not, stand firm, and you will see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord is my strength, they sing as a song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. You want to know how they got there? Go back to verse 19 of chapter 14. Verse 19, chapter 14. It says, then the angel of the Lord, who was going before the host of Israel, underline that if you have your Bible, before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. Now, I don't want you to miss that. Up until this point, verse 19, the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, guiding them all the way up to the Red Sea, stopped and he goes behind them, Right? The host of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So no longer is this picture of the, this pillar of cloud and, and the power and presence of the Lord ahead of them. Now what happens? The sea's about to part, and that pillar moves behind them and forms this barrier between them and the Egyptians. So God is standing between them and their enemy. And then in uh, verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Could you just imagine that? being there a part of the Israelites. Moses has done this, holds his hand out. God parts the water, and Moses obviously turns around at some point and says, come on, let's go. You're like, wait, what? And you're walking into the sea where it's dry land, and you're falling there. There's a pillar of cloud behind you. What a scene. What a spectacle. Verse 23, and then the Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, chariots, horsemen, and in the morning watch, the Lord, in the pillar of fire and the cloud, looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into panic. 
clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before the Lord, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. This was the aha moment. They're, they're starting to get it. They see it. They understand it. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned, covered the chariots and the horsemen and all of the host of Pharaoh that had followed them in the sea. None of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So that when they get to chapter 15, verse 2, they say in unison, in a hymn that they sing and they proclaim, the Lord is my strength and my song. And he is my salvation. This is my God. And I will praise him my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. I want you to bow your head with me this morning, and I, and I want to pray for you. We're going to sing a song here in a moment, and uh, we're going to be done. But here, here's what I want to do. I know in a room this size that there are probably some of you that, that came in that you're standing in front of something right now that feels just like the Red Sea. Maybe you feel like you're pursued, you're at the end of your rope, and you, do, you really just don't know where to turn. Here's, here's the promise from Scripture to you this morning is that God will fight for you. That He's a way maker. When there, when there doesn't seem to be a way in front of you, God's going to make a way. It may seem impossible to you right now, but God's going to make a way. I want to pray for you this morning. If you're here this morning and would just say, Keith, I'm just in a spot right now where I, it just feels kind of impossible, and I, I just want you to pray for me. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to, I just want to pray. Every head bowed. And every eye closed, if you would say, if you would just pray for me this morning, just slip your hand up. I just want to pray for you, okay? Anybody else? Yep, all over the room. Let me pray. Father, we're so grateful that you make a way for us when there doesn't seem to be a way. And God, you know every story from every hand that's represented. And we've all been there, God. There have been times that we've come to just what seems like a dead end in our life and our rope. And we say, what's the point? Can there even be life on the other side? God, I pray this morning that you would be a way maker, just in a way that it would just be unmistakable how you're moving. God, just give us the strength to be able to stand still and fear not and trust in your salvation. God, we know you're moving. Even when we don't see it, even when it doesn't make sense to us, we trust that you're going to make a way. So God, for every story that's represented in this room this morning, I pray just that, that you will make a way and that you will be glorified over every circumstance in our life. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.